So I notice a shift in the atmosphere. Our focus was solely on Him. Solely on Him. Our hearts, I feel like they've been opened up and the oil of the Holy Spirit just poured in. Amen? The balm of Gilead poured, poured on us. The oil of Jesus, the oil of the Holy Spirit, and God is just pouring His love on us. And I kept thinking, okay, God, what do you want? And I believe this. I believe there are people here this morning that want more. Listen, I wanted to get down on my knees, but then they had to come get me up off my knees. But that's what I felt, is that we were laying down our crowns. We were pouring out our hearts. Everything, spirit, soul, and body to Him. So I want us to... Just take a few minutes. I want you to come. I want you to come down. If, if if you're wanting to like, we can be some of it maybe here that doesn't know Jesus. That's the most important thing there. Yeah. You may want to make a commitment, a recommitment to Christ. But as we're worshiping, as we take just a few minutes more, and you know why we have plenty of time, Amen. take a few minutes more and bow at the, this is an altar. Bow at the altar. If you want to do it, your seats, but there's something about coming forward and making that commitment. Amen? Hallelujah. We can even lay hands on you. Just come on. Let's worship together. As we sing this last part, just come on down. Dedicate yourselves to Him. For I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, He, he, or she, who raises their hands to me, it is those hands that I will pour out all my blessings and my promises. For you have loved and chose to worship me, and I, as your Father, choose to send you gifts and chooses to take care of every need you have. Praise God. Let's praise you. Father, we praise you. We love you. We adore you. You hear our worship this morning because you're worthy of all of our praise because you've done great things. We just thank you this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Back in the day when I used to go to kids camp, I remember Pastor Rachel, Rachel Birchfield, what she used to say is the way that we spell worship is P-O-U-R. As a kid, I was like, she don't know how to spell. <laughs> but she was saying worship is actually where we pour ourselves out. And I was reminded this morning of the story of there's a woman in the New Testament and she has a, a year of her wages in this expensive perfume that she pours at the Lord's feet. And people have something to say about it because people always got something to say. People have something to say about it. And they're saying, you know, I can't believe she would waste this. I can't believe that she would be like this. But how many of you know that uh, Scripture says, she who is forgiven much loves much. And this woman went down in history as someone who worshiped the Lord extravagantly. And she took everything that she had paid with her life for that and she poured it out before the Lord. And you know, I think it actually, it kills our pride whenever we worship. Yeah, sometimes it takes the killing of your pride to sing the songs, especially whenever your life doesn't line up with what the words are saying about the Lord and you're like, eh, I'm not quite there yet. You know, I'm waiting to see that chorus in my life, Lord. But the truth is that's just a lack of gratitude because whenever we realize that we woke up this morning with breath in our lungs and we woke up this morning and in the nation that we're in and in the place that we're in and with the blessings that we have, I refuse to stand here and without gratitude pour myself out before the Lord. Yeah? And so killing your pride might look like something else. Pouring yourself out before the Lord might look like something. It's something that's completely different. Right? But if you're in here and you're like, wait a minute, why did that lady have to scream? Okay, well, she who's forgiven much loves much. Right? Why did that person have to shout like that? Well, she who's forgiven my blood sponge. Sometimes it's about what's happened in that person's life, the deposit that took place. How many of you know that we are vessels for the Holy Spirit? So whenever we pour forth, He's faithful to pour into us. 
And so sometimes, there are times where I don't want to worship because I'm like, I've already run it on empty. You know, I really don't have anything to give you right now. That's not the point. It's the exchange, the divine exchange happens whenever we pour forth in faith. He fills us to the brim. Yeah? So good morning. Welcome to church. What an honor to worship with our church family this morning, that we would have the opportunity to pour forth ourselves before the Lord in faith that he will fill you with what you need. Yeah? So this morning, if you need a deposit of faith, we serve the God of faith who can fill you with that deposit. If you're here and you need wisdom, we serve the God of wisdom who can fill you with wisdom. If you need healing, we serve the Lord, the Almighty, who is our healer, right? Our provider. Whatever it is that you need this morning, welcome to the divine exchange, which is the presence of God. We are excited to see you. And what we're going to do for the next few minutes, we're going to transition the service. We're actually going to greet each other for three minutes, and then we're going to continue our worship and giving. Right? So we'll see you in three minutes. All right. Praise God. Well, today I'm going to preach on the river of blessing. Yay. God has a river of blessing. I'm going to tell you how to get into his river of blessing. Now, the word blessed means happy, fortunate, and prosperous. Blessing is the ability to uh, succeed over, rise up over adversity. And so blessing is not something that you can do on your own, but it's something that God gives. I love to hear people say, I'm blessed, because it means that they have a relationship with God. They don't just say, I'm lucky, but they say that I'm blessed. So watch Mani said, everything that we do in God's service is dependent upon his blessing. And that's true. You can try to do things on your own and not be blessed, but when God blesses it, things happen because God can do so much more than what we can do. And so Jesus took five loaves and two fishes. He blessed them. He broke them. He fed 5,000 people, the miracle of multiplication. And so everybody wants to be blessed. They pray, well, God bless what I'm doing. But the best way to get blessed is to find out what God is blessing and then do that. Amen? To the same, God bless me. Say, God, I'm going to do what you said you're going to bless. And when you do what God said he would bless in his word, you get into the river of blessing. Amen? And uh, so there's a theme of blessing that flows throughout the Bible. And this is really amazing. But it begins with Abraham and it flows all the way through the New Testament. It climaxes in the Great Commission. And so God's blessing starts with a man named Abram who lived in Mesopotamia which is modern day Iraq. And so God chose Abraham and he said this to him in Genesis 12, go out from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so God tells Abram that he's going to make a great nation of him and through him, all the earth is going to be blessed. You know, that must have blew his mind because he's thinking, you know, he's just a, a man living out in the middle of nowhere. How's the whole earth going to be blessed through him? But he went looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Come on, he just, he left his home and took off just in obedience to God. And so later it says that Abraham was rich in cattle, silver, and go. And so the blessing of God came upon him and made him rich. And so Abraham had multiple herds and a whole lot of livestock. His nephew Lot also had a lot of livestock. And so the town wasn't big enough for both of them. Come on, have you ever heard that before? So it wasn't big enough for both of them. There wasn't enough grass for all the herds. And so Abraham told Lot, he said, you choose the land that you want and I'll take whatever you don't choose. And so Lot chose the best for himself. He chose the well-watered plains of Sodom. And so Abraham took the high arid land and let, Lot, and let Lot have the best. But later, Lot lost everything when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham was still rich. Why is that? Because he's blessed. Yeah. He's going to be blessed wherever he is, uh, not because of his location, but because he has the blessing of God yeah. upon his life. Amen? Yeah. And so... God's blessing was not just to Abraham, but it was to all of his descendants. 
And so Isaac, his son, planted in a time of famine, and he reaped the hundredfold return. Well, Isaac had a supernatural multiplication because he was blessed, amen, because of the promise of God to Abraham. And so God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you, but I'm going to make you a blessing. Sometimes people want to be blessed, but they don't want to share that blessing. And I said, God bless me, and they want to keep it all to themselves. But Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. And that's the whole secret right there. When God blesses you, you bless other people too. Yeah. Yeah. Don't keep all the blessing for yourself. Yeah. Because if you let some of it flow out, God's going to fill up your reservoir again. Yeah. And so God wants us to be a conduit for his blessing. Yeah. The Dead Sea is dead because nothing flows out of it. And the same thing happens to a person in every area of life, but also in their finances. If nothing flows out, you're going to end up being dead financially. And so when you bless other people, it activates your covenant with God. And so Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons who were the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they ended up being eat, uh, going to Egypt because they needed food and got that from Joseph. But they ended up being slaves in Egypt after a period of time. And so God sent Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. Then Joshua led them into the promised land. They won their battles. They had kings. They lived for God for a period of time. And then they backslid. And so they were carried off into captivity for 70 years. And then after 70 years, they came back and they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. And at that time, God's promise to Abraham had only partially been fulfilled. And then 400 years passed until Jesus is born. But in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus Christ was a descendant of Abraham, which means that Jesus' birth was part of God's covenant with Abraham. And when Simeon dedicated baby Jesus, he took him in his arms and said, thank you, God, for sending Jesus, this baby, to be a light to the Gentiles. And so he knew that, God, that Jesus being born was part of the fulfillment of God's covenant and his promise to Abraham. Amen. And so Jesus lived a life. He worked miracles. He taught. He trained disciples. And then he was crucified. Then he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. But before he ascended, ascended into heaven, he told his 12 disciples to wait in the upper room for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so 120 people waited in the upper room. And on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter got up on the, uh, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 3.25. This is what he said. He said, you're the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father Abraham. And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So here Peter is, and he connects the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles with the covenant that God made to Abraham. These folks knew what was going on. And they knew the Old Testament. They knew that they were part of God's plan and fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. And so the Apostle Paul takes the gospel across the Roman Empire to the Gentile world. And this is what Paul says in Galatians 3, 7. He said, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations... Be blessed. God's in the blessing business. He wants to bless all the nations. God loves you. He wants to bless you. Yeah. But, he, but it's not a selfish love. He wants to bless everybody. Yeah. Amen. God's not willing that any perish. And that's our purpose upon the earth, to take yeah. the gospel to everybody so that they can receive the blessings of God. Yeah. God's not like a man. He, he never runs out. Yeah. If he runs out, he can create more. Amen. Yeah. And so there's no limits upon God. And so God's big enough to bless you and everybody else in your town and everybody else in the world. Amen? God knows how to do it. And so Jesus' last words are, Go you therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so Jesus sent his disciples into all the world as part of the covenant and the promise made with Abraham. Amen? And so the Great Commission is to preach the gospel in all the earth. And so most of us can't go, but we can send. Amen? We can, and to send means to finance. So we can give in the mission to send other people who've been called and who can go. 
And so the so part of it is winning souls to Christ. The other part is teaching them and training them. Amen. We don't want to leave people as spiritual babes. So they have to be taught, cared for, and trained to grow up into the image of Christ. And so you can't separate the local church from missions. Amen. And so the local church is a, a very important part of missions because missionaries don't just appear out of thin air. They come out of local churches. Amen. Amen. They're called in local churches and then they go out. And the vast majority of financing the preaching of the gospel comes from local churches who send out missionaries. Amen. We do here in this church uh, with the homes going to, to Thailand. And so this church has planted another church in Thailand if you're new. And you didn't know that. Praise God. God's used us to have another congregation of, of people in a, a Hindu nation. Amen. Or not Hindu. It's a Buddha. Buddha. Okay. They worship Buddha. So, uh, and I think it's only maybe less than 1% Christian. And so God has used our church to be able to do that. When so is in Thailand. And so God's river of blessing is to bless the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we become a part of that, we get in God's river of blessing. You know why God takes care of tithers? Because they're supporting the preaching of the gospel. And he knows that if, if they're willing to do that, he puts finances into their hands. And the same thing is true when we give missions. If we're willing to give missions and that's an offering above our tithe, God will put the finances in our hands to be able to do that because God has to finance his kingdom and he's chosen to do that through you and me so we can have a part, so we can have an eternal reward. So one day when we go to heaven, people say, thank you for giving because I'm in heaven because you gave. Amen. That's the result of our giving. So you can't see the result of your giving Right now, this church has touched hundreds of thousands of people. A lot of churches have come out of this church, people who were raised in this church, and even their grandchildren, their children and grandchildren. And so if you if you look at the results of this church, my father being here for 50 years, you would be able to count thousands of Christians that came out of this little town. Uh, by because that's God's plan for blessing the whole earth. Amen. So when you get involved in things that God cares about, you get in the river of blessing. Amen? Amen? When your heart becomes God's heart, then you get blessed. And so God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing to other people. I don't know about you, but whenever I get blessed and I get unexpected money, you know, I, I tie to my church, but I also bless some other people too. Amen? And include them. And usually it's God speaking to you and saying, well, no, help somebody or, or somebody else. Um, and so we can never give away more than God can give to us. God's not a miser. Did you know the word miserable comes from the word miser? And so most misers are miserable. They don't think that there's going to be any more. So i got to hold on to everything I have because there, there's not going to be any more. Amen. But that's just the opposite of what, what Jesus said to do and what God said to do. Amen. Because when we give, God gives back to us, which means we can afford to give. Amen. Because God will give back to us. I've seen that word many times. But the blessing of God makes rich. Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and it addeth no sorrow with it. You know, the world can get rich on their own, but there's sorrow many times that comes with that. You can read the news sometimes and see all the sorrow that has come with people. And sometimes their, rich, their riches and their money become a curse to them. But it's a blessing of God that makes rich. And so Jacob was blessed by Isaac. He was in uh, the lineage of Abraham. He was blessed by his father Isaac. And then he went to work for a crooked man named Laban who kept changing his wages. And it wasn't fair. And he had to work 14 years for the woman he loved. But God gave him an ideal that prospered him. And so he ended up being wealthy. And he was more wealthy than the guy that he worked for. Another guy was a crook. And he was honest, but he ended up being wealthy. Why is that? Because of the blessing of God. Amen. Yeah. One of the ways that God blesses us is give it, he gives us ideals. Amen. And I find out those ideals come, one, as I pray in the Spirit, but also as I give. Amen. God brings ideals. Yeah. And so Joseph was blessed by his father. And his father gave him a fancy a, a, a coat. And so his, his mistake was wearing the coat. And uh, he wore the coat and his brothers were jealous because they didn't get one. And so they sold him into slavery. 
And so when God gives you a dream, it doesn't mean you're supposed to tell everybody. Right. Amen? Yeah. It may just be for you and yeah. and uh, and your wife. But if you tell your wife, she'll probably tell everybody. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just joking this morning. But, uh, but he was blessed. So anyway, so he ends up being a slave. He's in Potiphar's household, but he rises to the top of Potiphar's household. And then somebody lies on him, and he goes into the prison. And it sure didn't look like the blessing was working. How many know sometimes it doesn't, doesn't look like the blessing is working? Sometimes it doesn't look like your tithing and giving is working. But it is, amen, if you remain faithful. And so things come and things go, and sometimes we're attacked. Joseph was thrown into prison, but God gives him a way to get out of prison. He ends up being second in command of the nation, which was the most powerful nation on the earth at that time. And so he's the second most powerful person on the earth. And he was an inmate. That's got to be God. Amen? Yeah. And so it was a blessing of God that came upon our life. The blessing of God empowers you to do what you cannot do on your own. My dad used to say that the Holy Spirit will make you look smart. Yeah. Amen? He can give you ideas that you probably never would have had. And that's the insight that comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, I know people can get money without God's help. You know, the drug lord, El Chapo Guzman, had billions of dollars, but he ended up in prison. Elvis Presley died when he was 42 of a drug overdose. He had hundreds of millions of dollars, but his money brought sorrow, even though he had everything. And the sad thing is that Elvis still makes 40 million a year, 40 some years after he's dead. A dead man makes more money than you. Isn't that sad? But Elvis doesn't get to spend any of that money. And I'm not even going to say what maybe, a, I hope Elvis went to, to heaven, but praise God. Uh, so, so anyway, the blessing of God <laughs> makes rich. And so there's a blessing and promise to those who give it to the kingdom of God. And so when we're obedient, God blesses us. And I believe generosity is one of the keys to God's blessing in our life. And so Malachi 3.8 says, Will a man rob God? And you've robbed me, but you say, Where have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. God said they had robbed him in tithe and offerings. Amen? Which means we should give tithe and offerings. And so the word tithe means 10%. And it's the only place in the Bible where, where God tells you how much to give. Amen? And so I believe God means what he says. If he says 10%, I give 10%. Amen? And so that's the only place where it says that. And some people read 10%, but then they say, well, I'm going to give a little bit less for this reason or that reason. Amen? But you won't get the blessings of a tither unless you give 10%. Amen? Uh, and so, you know, if you got an electric bill for $200, how many would send it $100 thinking that they would accept that? If you did that, you're probably going to get your electricity cut off. And that's just electric company. Now, can you imagine sometimes people do that with God? And so if God asks for a certain amount, I'm going to give that amount. That's obedience. And so we should give offerings above our tithe, but the Bible doesn't tell us how much offering to give. But just because it doesn't tell us how much offering to give doesn't mean that we shouldn't give offerings. Now, when I first got saved, I started tithing. So me and my wife both had good jobs, and our tithe was quite a bit of money. And so we went to a church, and there would be guest speakers and different things, but I wouldn't even give an offering above my tithe because I thought, because I was kind of a tithe boy. Uh, at that point in my life. Uh, I wouldn't even give an offering to my tithe because I said, my tithe is plenty, you know, blah, blah, blah. And some people have that mentality, so they're just stuck at the tithe. But when I became a pastor, we had guest speakers, and I, I had to give. I realized, you know, if I'm asking other people to give, then I need to give myself, right? Uh, and so I began to give offerings, and they weren't big offerings, but I began to stretch and give more than what I had been given. And I found out that when you give, God gives back to you. And the same God who provided the tithe was also able to provide the offering. And whenever I stretch, then God stretched me. Amen? And so you say, how can you, how can you tithe? How can you afford to do that? Because God can increase your 100%. Amen? He can increase your income whenever you give. I've told this story before. My daughter Annie uh, was in Australia. And we gave, uh, she had living expenses, she was going to college, and we gave her like 75 a week for food, 
cell phone and her car payment. No, I'm just joking. She didn't have a car payment. So we gave, we didn't have, you know, a lot of money, but we gave her enough. It was just enough. And so Eddie called home and said she's supporting an orphan. Uh, you know, and, and uh, it was a, uh, what kind of, a compassion child. She said, I'm going to start compassion or supporting a compassion child for $30 a month. And I said, Annie, you are the compassion child. You can't, you can't, you're the orphan. You can't support an orphan if you're an orphan. And, uh, and so we started giving her an extra $30 a month so she could support uh, the orphan. And that's what God does with you. You know, when you step out of faith and say, well, I'm going to do this, you know, then God increases your 100%. Whenever you do that, but it's always your move first. The Bible says, "Give, and it shall be given unto you." It doesn't say it shall be given and then give. In other words, it's faith. That's one of the reasons why God uses giving of finances is because we exercise our faith with with uh, giving, and so God matches our level of generosity. Amen. He matches our level of generosity. If we're, gener if we're generous with the kingdom of the kingdom. What curse comes on those who don't tithe? Well, the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River and they had battles that they had to face to possess the promised land. They had to fight 28 battles before they possessed the promised land. The same thing is true in your life. You're going to have to fight some battles to possess your promised land. And, uh, and so if we don't tithe, then we don't have the blessing of God or help of God in fighting those battles. And we all fight battles for our family. I fought, I fought a battle for the salvation of my family before. Amen. Amen. We fight health battles. We fight financial battles. We fight spiritual battles. And if we don't have God's help, we will miss out. And so the, the first challenge or the first battle that the children of Israel had when they went into the promised land was the city of Jericho. And it had huge walls. And there's no way that you could get in. But God performed a miracle. You know the story. They marched around the walls of Jericho seven times and the walls fell down. And so it was a great miracle. But here's what God told Joshua in Joshua 6, 7. And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And so the Hebrew word for accursed means devoted. And so it should read, the city shall be devoted unto the Lord. And so the implication is if anybody takes what's devoted to God, a curse would come upon them. And then in Joshua 6.18, it says you, and anyway, let's keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves a curse when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are concentrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And so this is their first battle. And so God said, all the spoil goes to me because it's first. It's like giving God the first 10%. We do that because he's first. He comes before everything else. And so uh, in the book of Leviticus, it calls the tithe devoted. And it uses the same Hebrew word that's used for a curse right here. It says the tithe is devoted to God. In other words, it's his. And so the children of Israel conquered Jericho, but a man named Achan took some of the silver and gold, and he, he hid it in his tent. And so the next city they come to was a small city named Ai. They should have easily won that battle, but they lost that battle. And so Joshua was upset, and he goes to God in prayer, asking why they lost that battle. And uh, God told him some of the people have sinned and stolen the devoted thing. And so God tells him it's Achan. He goes to see Achan. Achan gives him back the silver and gold, and then they stone him to death. And I'm not suggesting that we do that to non-tithers today. But they stoned his family to death. And then they went on and they won the rest of their battles. Amen. But this, but this one sin kept them from winning. And, uh, and so what curse comes on uh, those who don't tithe us? It's not winning our battles. I mean, I think I've already said that. Now, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring you all the tithe to the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And prove me herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, there shall not be room enough to receive it. And so I'm going to break this down a little bit. And you now we read over the scripture quickly sometimes, and we don't really think about what it's saying. 
But first of all, it says to bring the tithe. In other words, it's talking about corporate worship. In other words, corporate worship or being involved in corporate worship is part of this promise and blessing. And the exception is if you're physically unable to go to church. Then that's a different story. God understands that. Or you live in Antarctica or someplace like that and it's too cold to get out and go to church. But otherwise, we should all be part of a local church. And it says bring all. Amen. All. All 10% of the tithe to the storehouse. So we don't decide, well, 10% is too much, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give less. And, and, you know, if you give less, you don't get the blessings that are promised to a tithe, right, man? The third key is the word storehouse. The storehouse in the Old Testament was the temple, and the New Testament is local, it's your local church. Another scripture in the Bible says give back to those who teach. In other words, give to where you're ministered to. I never go to a conference or a meeting where I don't give back. And let those people preach to me and teach me and give me free meals and then me not give anything back. Amen? Amen. I give back and God says to give back to those who minister to you. And so we support the local church with our tithe because God wants provision in our house. If you read Malachi 3, it says that there may be meat in my house. There may be financial provision. And so most churches could do a lot more if they had more finances. Amen? But they're limited by the finances that they don't have. And so when the church has finances, it can fulfill the will of God. Amen? Yeah. What about other ministries? There's a lot of other good ministries. There's missionaries that we support. We should support them, but not with our tithe. Amen? What about if we have kin folks in need or a friend in need? We should give to them and help them, but not with our tithe. So we tithe to our local church, but then we give offerings to other ministries. I support other ministries uh, besides this church, but my tithe goes to this church. Amen. And uh, and so God, the thing is, you can't out give God. Some people say, well, that's too much. No, you'll, you'll find out that God will stretch. If you'll take a step of faith and you'll give, God will give back yes. to you. Amen. Yes. Amen. And so I believe when we do things God's way, then we get God's blessing. I've heard people say, well, I've been giving my tithe to my grandma because she needs money or whatever. And you should support, help your grandma, but not with your tithe. Amen. Yeah. And uh, you give offerings. And so God wants us to get to the place where we're a cheerful giver. Nobody has to tell us to tithe or give above our tithe, but we enjoy giving. Amen? Amen. God wants to get us to the place that we actually enjoy giving. And I can say that I enjoy giving. Amen? It's, it just really makes me feel good. It's a, the greatest blessing in the world is to be able to give and help somebody else. Amen. And obviously I don't have unlimited resources, though, so don't come and see me after church. But uh, it's a great blessing to be able to give and to help other people. Amen. So God wants us to be a cheerful giver. And the promise is he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon us that there's not room enough to receive. I don't know about you, but I've got too much stuff in my house and in my garage. And my wife wants to bring more. And I said, no, you're not bringing anything else into this house. Amen? And so I've got more than I need. So God said, you'll, if you'll tithe and give offerings, you'll have an abundance. You'll have more than you need and, and enough to give over to other people. That's God's ideal for us, that we be blessed and have enough to give to every good cause, have more than we need. And you can't be a giver unless you have more than you need. Amen? Yeah. So God wants you to have more than you can need. More than you need. Amen? So he said he opened the windows of heaven. Does that mean that money is just going to rain down from heaven? No, it doesn't mean that. When the Bible speaks of windows, it's talking about opportunities. Amen. So God will send opportunities your way for your financial needs to be met. If you're an employee, that would be jobs or extra money on the job. If you are if you have your own business, that would be business that's sent your way. But God will send opportunities to you, but you have to steward those opportunities. Doesn't mean, just because you're tithing doesn't mean you don't have to work. Say, so, well, if I tithe, I can work and, and not be blessed. No, you still have to work. You have to steward the opportunities that God sends your way. Sometimes God sends opportunities my way, but I have to make the effort to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And when I do, finances come in. And so, sometimes God gives us ideals. Amen? And so, He'll give us ideals on how to get money. The other day, I needed $100. 
And I prayed, and God gave me an idea, so I borrowed it from my wife. But, uh, no, I, I'm joking. But, uh, anyway, so God will give you ideas on how you can meet your financial needs, but you still have to buy yourself. And then God, God will open up a door for a job, but you still got to work. So, uh, and by the time that it's God opening doors for opportunities, you say, well, you know, how much better is that than not having opportunities? Listen, there's people who can't get a job and, and they don't get any business. Why is that? Because the windows of heaven are shut over them, but the windows of heaven will open upon you if you're a giver. Praise God. And so I believe there's a harvest attached to every seed, but you always sow before you reap. And so there's a time period in between sowing and reaping. What do you do in that time period? And what you do in that time period will determine your harvest and how you receive. Amen? And so the Bible says you'll reap if you don't quit or if you faint. If you're not one of these people who has financial needs come your way and then you say, oh, tithing doesn't work. And sometimes we're tested in our giving and our tithing. And it's a test. God will test us to see if we're going to be faithful. If we're going to stand in faith. I've been in that place before. Where I, had, where I gave and it didn't look like I could afford to give, but I did anyway. Amen. I found out that God came through because it was a test of faith. It was a test of obedience. So some people give up and they say it doesn't work and they never receive their harvest. How can we water our seed? Number one, we should give an expectation. When you give, it should be an expectation. When you tithe, you should have the expectation. Your needs are going to be supplied. When you give offerings above your tithe, you should have the expectation that God's going to bring in a harvest of what I've given. Luke 6.38 says, Given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It says, Given it shall be given. So it doesn't say it might be given or it could be given. It says, It shall be given unto you. Amen. So we should give an expectation. Don't lose your expectation. Whenever I sow a seed, I know that I believe that a harvest is coming. I don't know how much. I don't know when. I don't know where it's coming from. I got a check uh, a couple of weeks ago from somebody that I never got a check from before. And it was just God. I knew that. It was, it was the exact amount that I needed. And it was God. And so it's God. God is our source. Amen. But he works through people. And so I should expect a harvest from my giving. I should live in expectation. And then we water our seat with praise. Psalm 67, 5. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Let the earth yield her increase. And God, even our own God, shall bless us. Praise moves God in your behalf. Amen. In any area of life, whether it's healing, whether it's finances, or whatever it is, but praise releases angels. Amen? Yeah. And praise moves God in your behalf for your financial needs to be met. Right. There was a pastor named J.R. Goodwin who pastored uh, in Pasadena back in the uh, 50s and 60s and part of the 70s and he, he preached in our church before back in the 70s and he had a, a big strong church in Pasadena but he was an old school man of faith and so he would tell the story whenever their church was building the building and they needed money and they would just they would pay cash you know as money came in they would build that building but he would go when he needed money he'd get in the church and he'd praise and dance and as he began to dance the people would stop, uh, would uh, drop checks by, and bring money by while he was in, in, while he was dancing, and so he just would praise the money in. Amen. He had needs, but instead of griping about it or worried about it, he just began to praise God. As he began to praise God, God met his needs. Amen. Sometimes the greatest demonstration of faith is praise in the midst of adversity. Amen. And we can also. Uh, what are our seed? By speaking the word of God. Psalms 103.20 says, Bless the Lord all his angels, mighty in strength, who do his word, who hearken to the voice of his command. The NIV says, Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones, who carry out his plans. And so angels work in our behalf, and they hearken to the word of God. And so that means when the word of God is in our mouth, we activate angels to move in our behalf. Amen. Whenever we speak the word of God. So I believe you should speak the word of God over yeah. your finances. Yeah, amen. amen. Because there's a lot of scriptures yeah. that talk about God supplying our needs. Yeah. And when we speak those over our finances, we exercise our faith. And when we do, God works in our behalf. Yeah. Amen. So I'm going to give you a few scriptures to say this morning. 
and you can speak over your finances every day, and I'm not going to actually give you the verse, but uh, but anyway, you can watch this and, and look up the verse later. But if everybody will stand up, I'm just going to give you a few scriptures that I say every day, and I declare, and I declare whether it looks like it's working or whether it's not. Amen? Amen. And so let's say this, say, I'm a tither and I'm a giver. The windows of heaven are open upon me. God's bringing opportunities to me to make money. I give generously and I receive generously. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. I shall not want for finances because God is my provider. God supplies all my needs according to His riches and glory. And that's just some of them. There's a lot more that you can look up. That's just some that I use that you need to declare. Amen. In the face of adversity, you declare the Word of God. Amen. And so there's one other thing you got to do. you got to give. you got to speak the Word. Act in faith. But you also need to ask. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Amen. And so if you don't ask for anything, you're not going to receive anything. Yeah. And I found that it's best to ask specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. A certain dollar amount whenever you need money. Yeah. If you need a job, yes, for a certain amount of money. If you got bills to pay, yes, God, for a certain amount of money. And so here today, I know that probably many of you have financial needs. And uh, maybe you have debt that you need to pay off. You've got some bills that you can't pay. Uh, you need a vehicle. You need a house or whatever it is. I want you to get a figure in your mind, a number in your mind of what you need. And then we're going to ask God for it. And then we're going to praise Him for bringing it in. Amen. And then when you leave today, I want you to just speak the Word of God over your finances. Amen? Amen. And, and be an expectation of God meeting your needs. I can't tell you when it's going to come. But I can tell you if, you, if you don't faint, you're going to reap. Amen? And God's going to bring it in. So you you have that. Hopefully everybody, you've got a number in your mind of what you're asking for. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. And you can just quietly ask Him for that. So Father, we come before you. We're thankful that you supply all of our needs. And Father, you see the needs that are here today. And we're asking for, and then you just tell the Lord quietly what you're asking for. And Father, we stand upon your word that we're a tither, we're a giver, we give generously. And Father, I just thank you right now for bringing the finances in. I thank you that you're a faithful God, that you honor your promises. And Father, we just give you praise even beforehand that those finances are coming in. In Christ's name we pray. Now let's praise him for it. Father, we praise you for it. Thank you that you're a provider. Thank you that you've never left us. You've always provided for us. And Father, we praise you in advance for what you're going to do. And we bless your name. Praise God. I, okay, so I was just remembering. I'm so thankful for the, the teaching this morning because all of us need to be reminded. And usually the first of the year, Bob teaches on giving in this way. And it's true. I can tell you some stories. The man refused to tithe. He really did. And that was a struggle. He, he knew it. He knew it. But the enemy will lie to you and you begin to doubt about it. So I'm so thankful that he would speak this to you. Because let me tell you something. When he started tithing, it was amazing what God began to do and the doors that, that began to open. But then we went to work for a pastor in Louisiana. And that pastor, there were special guests all the time. And this is why I appreciate him telling you this today. Because when it came to tithing, he tithed. When it came to giving, he didn't always have what he felt was extra money. We had two small children, you know, so it was tough. But that pastor said, I noticed that you and this, the children's pastor didn't give in the offering Sunday. And Bob said, well, I'll pay my tithe. And he said, but you didn't give in the offering. He said, when I take an offering, you need to put something in it because that is stretching your faith. And I'm not asking our people to give if you don't give. Now, that's pretty tough. That was pretty tough. But it stretched him. And even if it was, he said, I don't care if it's $5. I don't care what it is. Stretch. And God stretched and stretched and stretched. Us. That, by the way, was his brother, Mark. We worked for him. <laughs> but praise the Lord. The growth that happens when the pastor preaches a sermon Amen. 
and it stretches you. It's for a reason. It's because Amen. God wants to stretch us. Because he's got a huge, a huge uh, world to reach, doesn't he? Amen. Praise God. All right. Amen. I said, well, if you pay me more, I'll give more. <laughs> no, I'm not that dumb. But, uh, sure. Man, thank you, Lord. I'm not good about talking in front of people. Um, <laughs> it's crazy to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit like this. Amen. But cool, you know. So today I didn't have money, cash, anything like that, for ties. And I have been buried in areas, areas, and areas but, so I was just like, me and today, we're going to give me a couple of peppermints, even though I don't really hardly ever eat them. So God gave me these two peppermints. And when it's time for tithing, God said, you go tie these peppermints. <laughs> I'm like, no. And so since I didn't obey, I got convicted when everybody was coming up here putting their ties in um, just an act of obedience and whatever he says and what you have, you know, and so. But that's what he gave me, and so he said, I, I give it to you and you give it back. Amen. And I said, no, but so now I am giving it back, and I'm going to leave it right there, <laughs> whatever it's worth, Lord. Amen. 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 You're dismissed. We'll see you on Wednesday night.